Welcome, fellow disciples of Lady Fortuna. I think I solved my mic issues. Uh, let me know if uh, it works better now, if, you're, if you hear me better now. Welcome to this video. Um, this is going to be a multi-part series, uh, maybe three, four, maybe five videos. Um, initially, I was writing this script, so I wrote a script to discuss um, our speed. So I did a video on our speed last week, I think, this week, I don't remember. I will link it in the description, where I just discussed that uh, R is indeed a language if you write your own algorithms in pure R, but uh, if you're using functions that are built in into R or that are implemented in other languages like C and that are made available through packages, you will not have any speed issues or not you know, any, any more than in any other uh, language. However, if you do write your own loops, your own algorithms, they will be slow. And I wanted to have an example here that was a bit more realistic than what I did last time. Um, last time I just wrote a very simple function to expon exponentiate numbers. This time I wrote a genetic algorithm. So for those of you that are not familiar with genetic algorithms, you could watch this series to learn some very basic concepts about them. But this is not a video about genetic algorithms per se. This is a video about, uh, well, two things. First, the speed, but this will come at the end. And uh, most importantly, it's a video about how to develop this code, how, to, how I wrote this code using only, yeah, I guess, only tidyverse functions, which is not something that I think you should do if you want performance, because as I will explain throughout this series, Tidyverse is great for interactive data analysis because it's very uh, expressive, it's very simple. You can write in a couple of lines uh, of code, you can achieve great results. However, uh, because you're on so many levels of abstraction, so you, you're on, you know, on functions, calling functions, etc., etc., with pipes, etc., etc., you lose uh, some performance Whereas if you would focus or use a more base type of functions and also more basic objects like arrays instead of data frames and uh, loops instead of uh, map filter, etc., map reduce, sorry, this in general runs faster. And what I actually want to do is once I'm done with this code and explaining this code, I would like to rewrite this using base R, compare the two, um, I think the base R will be fa will be faster, but it will be much uglier. It will be much uglier code, and uh, also then I guess more difficult to maintain. We will see. And then what I would like to do would be to translate that into Julia, and uh, uh, see how uh, the performance is improved because it will it will run faster in Julia. That's that's for sure. Anyway, let's start with uh, the first function that I want to optimize and also with the first part of the genetic, genetic algorithm, I, because genetic algorithms have several parts to them. So let's start with this. I will maybe also very quickly explain, once I'm done showing you this function, uh, how a genetic algorithm works. Anyway, the first function I wanted to optimize is one that I found on this website, um, some kind of, I guess, of homework student project type of thing. It's an interesting function, because it's not too complicated. I mean, it's only four lines of code, five lines, but it looks like this. So this is a bitch to optimize with a simple newton raphson type of algorithm. So the hill climbing algorithms, they will have a lot of trouble uh, optimizing this because they will get very likely stuck on this local optima that you see, and there's a bunch of them. And the global optimum, what interests us is over here, like between, I don't know, 0.1 and, uh, and I guess here the same 0.1, and it should be at 1, okay? That's actually what, what I found uh, after letting my code run for some time. That seems to be the solution. Anyway, um, I wrote two th this function two times, one time with two uh, parameters and one time with only one parameter. And this will be important for the first function that I will show you uh, tonight which is how to initialize a population. So let me maybe now explain how a genetic algorithm works in, a, in very simple terms. The idea is actually quite simple. 
you have this function that is quite complicated to optimize. What you do is you start with um, maybe a population of 100 totally random solutions, totally random. You might just, you know, if you, if you can plot it, you know, two dimensional or three dimensional here, you can plot it, but if it's higher dimensions, you can't. But if you can plot it, you can kind of look where it is. So you could, instead of, you know, taking a huge, a huge range for your numbers, for your random numbers, you could already focus and just pick numbers between 0 and 0, 2. I picked 0 and 1 because I assumed that I didn't really know where, where my, um, my uh, global optimum was, okay? So totally random. You evaluate this function. So if you want to um, maximize, in this case, maximize the function, you see which solutions produced the highest value. Then you select the best performing ones. And this, there's many ways of doing that. Uh, there's a lot of, of different ways of selecting these best performing ones. I did the most basic thing that, uh, that you could do. I just picked the best ones. So the 10 best ones, the 10 best solutions. I completely erased the 10 worst solutions. And then what remained, I just randomly picked 10 of them. So I didn't only want to get this top 10 elites because I thought, you know, having there's maybe, you know, some diversity would perhaps help the algorithm. And I'm not even sure of that, to be honest. Once you're done with this, what you do is, uh, so you have this, I, so I, I did the 10 elites and 10 random solutions. I made them have babies. So how this uh, works is quite simple if you're not familiar with the process. In the case of the stalagmite function, I have X and Y. So I have a vector of two real numbers. To get a baby, I just pick two vectors, a mom and a dad, and I just switch the uh, Ys, for example. So I have x1, x2, or rather x1, y2, x2, y2, and then I get x1, y2, and uh, x2, y1. Two kids per couple, basically. Um, this, again, is the, probably the simplest way of doing uh, this. This is called crossover. Uh, there are other ways of doing that. This is probably the, the simplest way of just doing a crossover. So I generate kids. Then I... Uh, add in so um, two things random mutations with very low probability so I just add some random uh, white noise uh, with a very low probability and uh, I also oh yeah and before the mutations I also remove with again a very low probability some of the kids okay so this is again uh, just to imitate the natural process of, of natural selection, basically. So you have some random mutations, you have sometimes uh, some elites that don't survive, or some uh, children's elites that, that don't survive. You have um, some others that uh, should have left the gene pool a long time ago, but somehow they stuck around, so here we are. And uh, yeah, and, uh, and this imitates kind of this, this whole process, right? And then this runs for, um, well, it, again, it depends on how you, how you do it. I, um, I, di I, I did something quite simple. I just specified the number of iterations that I want, and this runs for like 10 iterations, 20 iterations, and so on. So this is the basic, you know, basic um, way this algorithm works. So there's, there are many functions there that are necessary to make it work. The first function is the initial so a function to generate an, in, an initial population now this was already quite interesting because this is actually very simple right you just generate some random numbers however and this is why I, I, I wanted to make this video series when I first started writing that I wrote code that worked for my stalagmite function with which remember two parameters to optimize so basically my code over here which used this stalagmite function, I had my two parameters and I thought, okay, let me do something clever. I don't want to hard code that I want to generate vectors of two dimensions. Okay, I want something a bit more flexible, right? So what I did is I used this function that maybe you're not aware of called formals. So formals, what formals do, does, is the following, stalagmites. So it, it simply gives back 
the arguments of your function as a list. So now I have a list of two. And this was useful because then I could compute the length of this and I would have how many parameters my function has. And then I could simply do something like rerun. So if I have two parameters, rerun our unif, let's go with uh, five just to show you, I get two vectors of five uniformly distributed random numbers. So that's basically what I wanted to do here. So you see, we run the length of my parameters. So how many parameters do I have? And then how many, uh, how, what's the size of my population? And then an, a lower and an upper bound for my uh, R unit. However, this was a bit, this was not as flexible as I thought because when I went to the next function, I what I didn't do here, which was hard coding um, the number of parameters, I actually ended up, without noticing, I actually ended up doing it here. I will explain this in the next video. But over here, I used map2. So this would map over two parameters. But if I had a function with n parameters, that wouldn't work anymore. So when I wanted to write a more general approach, this didn't work anymore. So I had to change uh, my strategy. And the impact of changing this made that I also had to change this. Because as you see now, my code is a bit more complex. Now I have this very weird formals objects, uh, objective function, which is the function that I want to uh, optimize. Then I have this, um, this I don't remember, this slice. I think it's a slice, you call that right? Of one, so I pick the first element of that. And then I evaluate that. So that's much more complicated. Why? The reason is because I had to rewrite because again, I had to switch from map two, which was R coded to two parameters, to something here that is flexible. Here I can have as many parameters as I want. And again, this this is the function to evaluate the candidates, which we will discuss uh, ne next time in more detail. But because of I had to do that, I had to change this. And to change this, the, what, what that meant was that I could not have here two parameters anymore. I needed to have a function with only one parameter, and that parameter would then be a vector of parameters. Or, yeah, a vector of parameters. M meaning, if I do now, OK, so formals, stalagmite, two, two parameters. Form, uh, formal stalagmite 2, that's only one parameter, which is, or rather one argument, which is this factor of two parameters. However, this is a dotted pair list. If I compute the length of this thing, it's one, okay, it's not two. Because this is a language object. So I, I wasn't aware of that. I asked for some help on Twitter and a very kind soul helped me with this. This is a language object. So this is not something that, um, so, so, so this, is not, this is not my vector here. This is an object that describes this vector and it's length one. So if I want to get the length, I need to first evaluate it and this actually even before that, I actually need to pick, maybe let me just remove this for now. Why? Because this thing here, this uh, square bracket, square bracket one, this actually gets you this. Because this is, again, this remember this is a list, so this is the name, this is x, and this is what's inside. Doing this simplifies the object, and now I can evaluate it. So now it is actually a vector with two zeros, and now I can compute the length. And now I get the length of two. And now this is not hard-coded anymore. I can have something very arbitrary as an objective function, something with uh, with 10 parameters, doesn't matter. This will then have a value of 10, and this will generate uh, a nice uh, list of 10 randomly uh, generated vectors. So. It, this will then generate something that looks like this. Or if, if we want to have 10, for example, if we have a function with 10 parameters, 
And then the rest is, I think, quite self-explanatory. I just bind the columns and I use genetically in the names of the columns just to have x1, x2, x3, etc. as the names of the columns. However, notice here two things. First of all, this, this trick here with formals only works if your function has default parameters or def a default argument, which is the case here. Right? Uh, it's over here, yeah. If I don't write that, if I don't write this equal C00, formals here, that this trick will not work because formals will just pick uh, the X, and but there's nothing inside of it. So formals does not know beforehand how many how long x will be, basically. So you have to, to, to do this in order to find, in order to uh, give formals this information. And this made me realize something very important that I, I never thought about that. In your optimization algorithms, you always have initial parameters that you give to your algorithm. If you don't give them, they will usually be at zero or at one or some other random value. And I thought, okay, this is just, you know, this is this is a bit weird because you never really know, I mean, how, uh, with, what kind of, of initial values do you want to give in, to, to give to, to the function, right? Because you have, beforehand, you have no idea. Well, you might have some ideas for some applications, but usually you don't really know where your parameters are going to end up. But now I think one of the most important uses of these initial parameters vectors is, is exactly for this. It's to give to the solver the dimension of your problem so that, you're, so that the solver knows, well, I have to optimize five parameters because this is important for, for example, this kind of stuff that I, that I did here. So I did it in another way. I didn't use this, an, an initial parameter uh, or initial value uh, vector. Uh, I didn't ask the user to give that. But I, uh, I, I now ask the user to, to actually do it, to, to actually give here the initial, the initial values as, um, as a uh, default argument of, uh, of the function. So I found that quite interesting because I'm mostly a user and not a developer. And now I went into the shoes of a developer for, for, some, for some, some hours, some days in working on this. It made me realize a lot of these things. So... Um, so that's the first the first function. This only initializes, and we can we can try it. This only, uh, if I want, uh, for example, stalagmite. This this only initializes um, one hundred uh, totally random solutions. Um, then we need to score them. So for this, we're going to use the evaluate candidates. So this is going to I'm going to discuss that next time in more detail because I've been recording for almost twenty minutes. Let me just show you what happens if, um, if uh, I uh, don't do this, but this, if I just evaluate my candidates now, so my function is still stalagmite, and my population to evaluate is the output of the initial population function. I get a new column here called score. So this is the score, um, this is the value basically of my function at this um, at this um, x1 and x2. Now, just before uh, finishing, let me just show you um, how it looks. So this is the genetic algorithm function, which incorporates all the different functions. And notice that here I have a while loop. So this is <laughs> this is the first while loop I've written, no joke, probably in like five years, something like that. Because I, I usually, when I need to do stuff like that, uh, I usually just use recursive functions. But here, for um, for uh, the purposes of uh, of uh, speed, uh, loops are, are better than recursive functions in R. Uh, because R, again, is not a, a pure a pure functional programming language. And, you know, if I, if I run this once, I get one solution, but the idea of genetic algorithms is to run them a lot of times on a lot of random populations. So here I just did it two times with rerun again, and I get, uh, if I take a look at OPT optimization stalagmite 2, I get two solutions. So here actually the, actually the solver found the maximum uh, at the ninth iteration, and here uh, it didn't. So you see, the importance of, of running it, and you can do that then in parallel. Um, 
which I could show you next time, I guess. You could run that you know, four in, on four cores or something like that, and you get, hopefully, you would get the, the solution. Um, even on a simple problem like that, I, I ran it a lot of times. Even on a simple problem like that, I don't. All, I think this is just the second time that I actually that I find the uh, the exact optimum. So it's not. I mean, I, I'm quite. I'm usually quite close, you know. But um, but the, the, really, the optimum is not is not always always uh, found. Uh, and then I have other functions, which I could show you also next time that are a bit more complicated, but it's kind of the same idea. So next time we will discuss how to evaluate candidates. So again, if you're interested in genetic algorithms, keep watching. But if, if even if you're not interested in genetic algorithms as such, um, I think there's still some little tricks here that will come, especially this C across will be interesting to, to, to see. And also another one, little little appetizer, this function called crossdf, which really <laughs> was uh, a lifesaver. Anyway, hope you enjoyed. Have a good one and see you next time.